I mean, where, what is creativity? Where does that come from? In my senior year at high school, I gave a talk about the spiritual and psychological benefits of LSD. Well, somebody in the question and answer at the end said, so Maharishi, you said we're supposed to follow the laws of our land, right? He said, yes, yes. Well, if that means getting drafted and going to Vietnam, should we do that? I won't you know, sugarcoat it. Uh, working closely with a master is not an easy thing often. And there, putting books in the shelf was Allen Ginsberg. Wow. It was unbelievable. There's a softness to India. I know it's crazy and chaotic and all of that, and, but there's an essential softness. I've been working at this very crazy business for 60 years. Woof, woof. Welcome to Kanakast. In this episode, I'll be speaking to Michael Bernard. Michael is an artist and a filmmaker. He has been practicing transcendental meditation for over 50 years. In fact, he helped set up the film and media facility at the Transcendental Meditation Organization and worked very closely with Maharishi Mahesh Yogi. He then went on to work in Hollywood in various commercial projects. In this conversation, we talk about growing up in America in the 60s and 70s, which was a pretty crazy time, also his interaction with uh, Maharishi Mahesh Yogi and his spiritual search, and also, of course, the creative process. I hope you enjoy this conversation. So, Michael, thank you so much for joining us in the Kana studio. It's such a pleasure to have you here. It's been a pleasure to be here. And uh, we've been uh, used to seeing you. You've been shooting in the yes. studio, and it's been nice to have you here. But now we finally get to interview you. You're in front of the camera rather yeah. than behind. My pleasure. So I wanted to ask you, you are here uh, because you are filming this beautiful uh, uh, documentary film called Going to the Source, right? which is uh, a journey um, through uh, to the eyes of many, many uh, followers of the Maharishi Mahesh Yogi. Yes. And what was the, this? Uh, what, tell us a little bit about this project. What is, what well, is it? This really started in 1971 when I had just finished becoming a TM teacher. And at that time, Maharishi would meet with each person he made a teacher individually and kind of interview them. And so I had my meeting. And um, he looked at my resume. He was sort of like a CEO, you know, with the <laughs> resume and everything. And we talked for a little while. And then he said that he'd like me to start a film department for him. And I agreed. Uh, my wife was four or five months pregnant. Um, <laughs> we just stayed on. Uh, we never went home for seven years. We just... wow kept going with Maharishi and our son was born in Austria at a TM course there in September. Wow. Yeah, we were, well, it was the sixties. We were young. It all worked out. Um, it was great actually. Anyway, I did that for seven years. And then at the end of that time, I had two young boys and no money, of course, because this was all volunteer basically. And an extraordinary experience, though, I have to say, working directly with Maharishi. It was not always easy, but always amazing. Um, anyway, I went to Hollywood, started a career there, have a company. And then um, in 2015, and I didn't have much contact with the TM organization during this period. I meditated every day. I felt very close to Maharishi this whole time, even though I had no contact with him. Anyway, in, in 2015, they hired me to come to Maharishi International University in Iowa to run the David Lynch Graduate School of Cinematic Arts. It's an MFA program, and I decided to do it. It was at a good time in my career. And um, so I spent three or four years there doing that. And while I was there, I had the idea that I should be documenting the experiences of people who 
knew and worked directly with Maharishi sure. before they all. Actually, what really happened is I had the idea, and then I went back to L.A. in 2018, exactly now in January, um, for some health issues that I had to deal with. And um, I met with my original teacher, the guy that tr taught me Transcendental Meditation, a man named Jerry Jarvis, who was very important to the TM movement for many, yes, many yes. years. He was very well known. I yeah, think. very well known. Hmm. Great guy. And I told him my idea, and would he and his wife be willing to be interviewed? And he said, yeah, of course. In my mind, I had to raise money, start a company, you know, do a whole real production. So I said to him, great, I'll be back in July, and we'll do that. And then I left, and two weeks later, he passed away. Oh. <laughs> so suddenly, it became clear to me I couldn't wait. Mm. So I just started doing it with, I own all my own equipment. I was being housed in a beautiful apartment in Fairfield with a giant living room with floor to ceiling windows that I used as a studio. Mm -hmm. And I just, and all these people lived there and came through there. So I just started filming. And um, so that was six years, almost six years ago. So, and And since then, I've traveled all over the U.S., um, and I filmed now over 150 interviews. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And par part of my original idea wasn't necessarily to make a film exactly, but to create an archive of all these experiences that would be available for future generations. I, I just felt it was really important that people have a chance to understand who Maharishi actually was as a man, as a teacher, which is extraordinary. But, you know, he was not a god. He was not a deifiable. He was a man who was an enlightened man who dedicated his life to bringing enlightenment to the world. And uh, so I just started accumulating all these interviews. And um, I, at one point, edited together a little seven-minute clip just so people could see. And I built a website. And that's when I started thinking, maybe this could be a film. Mm. And so that idea has been gaining traction over the years. And I've begun gaining support from people. And I now have a team of supporters who have helped financially, but also in thinking through all of this. And one of the people is Jack Forum, who wrote a bestseller about TM in the 70s. And uh, we... We've been friends since then, and um, he's writing a very detailed biography of Maharishi right now. So okay. he is going to help me to write the parts of the film that need to be written. He'll come to Santa Fe next spring, this coming spring, and um, we'll aim to try to finish the film in maybe the spring of 2019, if things go well, but maybe later. Simultaneously, a movie producer who lived in New York for a long time and worked at the Weinstein, Weinstein Company for 15 years, he moved to Fairfield, not a meditator, but they heard about the Maharishi School, mm -hmm. and they wanted to get their kids out of New York City into a holistic, healthy kind of place. Sure, sure. And then they started meditating, and then he found out about my project and got very excited and um, thought maybe we could do something we could sell to Netflix or whatever. So he and I have been working together on a version of the film that will be more for the public. Oh, okay. I've never really thought this would be interesting to the general public because it's a little bit devotional and it's you know not a subject that a lot of people are that interested in, actually. But we decided that we'd look for a famous well-known maybe actor, presenter, on-camera person. And we're working with Bob Roth of the David Lynch Foundation to find someone that mm -hmm. will do that. And mm -hmm. hopefully this coming year we'll find that person, we'll write all the portions that need to be written. And maybe by this time next year we'll film that person and then start finishing the film. And I think that will make it more interesting to a Netflix or Apple TV or something. To a wide audience, you can take it to a wide audience. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, the problem, of course, is that all these 
places like a Netflix or whatever, they're looking for conflict. They're looking sure. for scandal. They're That's looking for juicy stuff. <laughs> there isn't that kind of juicy stuff in the story. And, um, and I have no interest in, there's, you know, there are a few little things here and there, but they're so minor and uncertain. I mean, when, Netflix has lots of series on spiritual people, but they are ones who are controversial, who have a right. lot of controversy that's right. and they are very, uh, you know. Uh, and they're they're interested, like they did one on Rajneesh. Yes, Wild Wild Country. Wild, yeah, which was actually really good. They did a great job. It was very well made. I think it was the Duplass brothers, if yeah, I'm not mistaken. That's made, right. It's a very well made series. Yeah, and I Although I, I, I think it is a little biased. but <laughs> Well, yeah. and But, but in any case, uh, that's... That's not good. That there's no story like that. They're just you absolutely, know. absolutely. And and also Maharishi. I mean, whatever may people may think of him or TM, you can't really deny the fact that this is a man who took the technique of transcending and made it available to the public, maybe for the first time in human history. Mm -hmm. Before that, it's always, as I understand it been for the select few the monks the mystics the people and and i th that was not without some controversy from other followers of maharishi's master gurudev mm -hmm. they were not all in favor of him doing this but he did it and he and since he came to the west which was 1959 it there's been this huge explosion and i one can't say it's all Maharishi's doing, obviously. There's Yogananda, there's other other teachings. Sure, but sure. and the time was right. Hmm. My generation, the sixties, hmm. we were waiting for we were looking for something like this. Absolutely. Absolutely. And um so it was a perfect timing and Maharishi's choice to present this in terms of science, not spirituality or sure. Sure. Um, was very wise and and connected with people all across American and European culture. So um, it was an extraordinary kind of change in consciousness that happened then. And now people take it for granted. Everybody knows about mindfulness, meditation, yoga, sure. Sure. organic food, all of that. But in 1960, I can tell you, nobody knew about that here in the of West course, anyway. Of course. Or there in the West, um, so uh, it's an extraordinary story. Absolutely, and Absolutely. Um, and we can't wait to see uh, see yeah. it once it's completed. Going to the source, yeah. Well, the full title is "Going to the Source: The Maharishi Chronicles." Oh wow! And and um, <clears throat> the interviews we filmed in this studio were really wonderful. I mean, I have to say, I managed through luck and through help from other people and through your guys' good grace and letting me film here, um, some extraordinary people. Mm -hmm. um, and they had extraordinary experiences with Maharishi. And um, it just adds a whole layer of Absolutely. greatness Absolutely. to this thing. So I wanted to ask you, since you've done so many interviews, 150 interviews, Sometimes during the interview process, you know, because you're talking about Maharishi, somebody who's uh, been uh, someone you've looked up to and someone you've learned from and who's taught you, is it you always discover new things. You always learn new things while doing an interview. You learn a lot. But there's also the danger that you go into the zone of just being devotional and not asking the questions. Right. Is that How do you counter that? <clears throat> well... I maybe don't do a good job of avoiding that as <laughs> possible, but we the experiences that people have are not talked about in those terms. They're talked about more in terms of inter what well, let me start again. In my experience and in the experience of many others, and we're talking thousands of others. In working with Maharishi, there was always this one-on-one -on -one interaction, which seems to have always been for the benefit of that person's mm -hmm. evolution. While simultaneously, you know, accomplishing things that needed to be done. 
And often this wasn't particularly blissful or sweet. Sometimes it was very difficult. And, um, and so we have talked about many of those things, quite frankly. And um, what it comes down to is, as uh, one of the people I interviewed once said, people's experience of Maharishi is that he's basically nature speaking English or Hindi. I wow. mean, but, you know, in, our, in the West, English. And I think that's accurate. I, in my experience, and I had some extraordinary experiences with Maharishi, completely unexpected, and I didn't have any intention of having, you know, I wasn't a mood maker kind of person. Mm -hmm. I was very, and my interactions with Maharishi were always natural and direct. And I think he liked that because I wasn't obsequious and, um, you know, asking personal questions and all that kind of stuff. It was business and um, very straightforward and very natural. Um, and I think uh, these experiences describe a person who really was nature in an individual form. Mm. Pure nature. So, and there's so many things that I did, and I've discussed this with others who've had similar experiences where we do an interaction about some, in my case, thing to do with film. And he'd say, do this particular thing. And it would, on the surface, seem a little bit crazy, frankly. Yeah. Like, okay, all right. And, you know, I would resist sometimes. Uh, yeah, you don't agree with it. Yeah, but i go, okay, fine. Years later, it would prove to be unbelievably correct. I'll give you an example. When I first started filming Maharishi, uh, it was 1971. And in the U.S., people filming 16 millimeter in the U.S. almost always used ectochrome film, which is like a slide film. It's not a great film, but it, that's what people in the U.S. used. And so I had a little editing room in one of the hotels in Mallorca where we were staying. And occasionally I would show Maharishi dailies. We'd sit and I'd have a little hand crank viewer oh, wow. that would project up on the wall and mm -hmm. have a sound reader. And I'd crank it through and we'd sit and look at stuff. And one day he said, you know, the color is not very accurate. I said, I know, but this is what we shoot in the U.S. and that's just how it is. He says, no, no. In, I've seen in England and Germany and Japan and other places, they shoot some other kind of film. It's much better and that's what you should use. Well, that turned out to be color negative 16 millimeter, which at the time was very grainy, which is why it was not used in the U.S. Because at that time, you have to understand, the news was shot on film. So... They didn't want it to look grainy, so they shot mm -hmm. ectochrome. And also, it was a reversal film, so they could develop it and put it on the air. So um, I researched it and found out what they shot, which was this color negative. And I dutifully went and bought that, and that's what we started shooting with. <clears throat> and at the same time, he was pressuring me to set up our own film laboratory to process our own film. Now, nobody does that. That's <laughs> industrial level. Sure. I mean, and I resisted that. So we finished our first film. He wanted me to make 100 prints. It was an hour long of him giving a talk. I went to Hollywood. I got the negative cut. And then I started going to Technicolor, Deluxe, Movie Lab, all these famous. Nobody could make a clean print because it was 16 millimeter, mm -hmm. and they didn't know how to handle the color negative. Finally, I found a small lab that was able to do the job, and I got the prints done. So the next time he asked me to start a lab, I said, you're right, we'll do it. <laughs> and so as we were, and I found a partner who knew about film chemistry and everything, you got to remember, I was 25. Wow. 24, 20, we were kids. Wow. I mean, it's wild. And we went and got a loan from Crocker Bank to buy all the equipment. It was $150,000 back then. And um, at the moment we were ordering the processing machines, 
Kodak announced they were coming out with a new 16 millimeter color negative that was very fine grained. Wow. And so at, we ended up setting this all up in an old hotel in the Catskill Mountains in upstate New York. And we became one of the first labs in the world to run this film. Wow. So the engineers from Kodak, which were in Ro Rochester, New York, would come down and help us because there were these kids out in the woods with the wow. state of the art. <laughs> incredible. But it's incredible. But this gives you an example. I mean, it's a long, complicated story. Yeah, if you had resisted and said, no, I'm going to go with Ektachrome and don't. <laughs> yeah. It would never so, have happened. And, and this wasn't Maharishi calculating and thinking. He just, I think, this is my experience that he just made that decision out of nature and mm. in the course of things, it proved to be an incredibly correct idea. And I've wow. seen that over and over in many other. So that uh, is incredible. That yeah. is absolutely incredible. Yeah. So you started shooting very young, obviously. I yeah. Mean, you were 25 when you were setting up this lab. So you must well, have started. Start I started making films when I was 16. Wow. I, wow. I started, I'm an artist, and I started making experimental art films. Mm hmm. This is, we're talking San Francisco Bay Area, 1964. Is that where you grew up? No, I grew up in Massachusetts. I was born in Hollywood, but I grew up in Massachusetts. And then we moved to the Bay Area when I was a teenager. And um, I just started making these weird little films. And um, at that very moment in the Bay Area, there were some very... Um, uh, fundamental experimental film people that were just beginning to make films. And I was lucky enough to find them and be influenced by them. I never took a film class. Mm -hmm. I never studied film. Self-taught. Totally self-taught. Um, but um, I did, I was around these amazing Stan Brackage, uh, um, Bruce Connor. Uh, there's a group of them in the Bay Area that were very influential, and I happened to get to know them. And I started with eight millimeter film and made a bunch of eight millimeter films, and then got a Bolex. And I would put the Bolex in my backpack and hitch all over the place and film things and make these weird little films. Wow. Yeah. So when I went to TM teacher training, I wasn't a professional filmmaker, I was this artist making avant garde weirdo films. <laughs> And I told that to Maharishi. She said, mm. I'm not a professional. I'm an artist. Mm. He said, doesn't matter. doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then a year later, I was joined by another filmmaker who had worked professionally at WGBH in Boston and who knew how to do everything properly because I was just making s s things up, you know. As you went along, yeah. Yeah. So I learned from him and he and I worked together for a, f a number of years. Wow. And... um he became a Purusha eventually. Wow. And wow. Uh, Purusha, for those who don't know, is the class of uh, monks. That's right. Yeah. There's, there's, there's the, for the men, there's this thing called Purusha where they are monks and they live a celibate life. And then there's Mother Divine for the women and they do similarly, although they're much more detached from the re everyday world. The men often are very active in the mm -hmm. outer world, mm -hmm. but they, live in a group and they Very meditate a lot and so forth. So so was there something in your childhood that drove you towards the arts? You said you were an artist making these avant-garde films. Where did that come from? Were you always into creative stuff? Well, yeah. I mean, when I was a boy, I wanted to be a baseball player. Then I wanted to be a fighter pilot. Fighter pilot, I think, is common for everybody yeah. across the world. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Fortunately, my eyes went when I was a teenager, so that was out. My my father was a commercial airline pilot for TWA. Oh, wow. So I knew a lot about airplanes, and I'd flown a lot. And my mother took a lot of care in bringing me and my brothers to museums and all that kind of stuff. But I actually had an experience, this is very dramatic actually. Um, we lived on Cape Cod in Massachusetts, a very beautiful, wild place. 
and my great uncle was a fisherman and so forth. And after we moved to California, I would go back in the summers to work in a restaurant because I missed being there. And um, so when I was 16 or 17, maybe 16, um, I had this experience where I got sick one day. I just got sick. And um, I woke up at around 2 in the morning, feverish. And there was a big party going on in the house next door. And I got up and I went out. And our house was on a hill looking towards the bay in one way and towards this big saltwater marsh. And there were low hills. On the other side of the hills, a painter named Edward Hopper lived, who's very mm -hmm. famous American. Of course, yes. Yeah. Yes. And, Nighthawks. Um, Nighthawks is by Hopper. Yes. And actually, he did a painting of a gas station called Esso, which was my first job working wow. at that station. Wow. That's it was incredible. called Mobile. But I worked, it was called Jack's Esso when I worked there. Wow. Anyway, so I go out. It's two in the morning. The, it's a full moon, which is setting over the hills. And the marsh is, uh, steam is rising. So it's backlit by the moon. And something happened. I looked at that and the switch flipped. And I said, I have to paint this. Fortunately, the previous owner of the house was a sea captain who did paintings and stuff. And he died suddenly and his whole workshop was left with canvases, oil paints, the whole thing. So I immediately went in there and started painting. Wow. It was like a switch just got flipped and wow. that was it. It was just like- It was just the beauty of that moment. The, absolute... the beauty, it was the beauty. And, and <coughs> excuse me, I, I've come to understand that the experience of beauty, which is common to all humans, is an experience of transcendence. And when a person transcends even a little bit, that changes them a little. Hmm. And I think the role of art um, in particular is to create experiences of beauty for people. They're, they're transformational experiences. And that's what I chose to do with my film career. Um, at a certain point, I moved to New York City with my girlfriend who became my wife and the mother of my kids and discovered that the art world was not, as I had thought, this temple of aesthetics on the hill, but just like everything else, you know, commerce and of course, who do you know and all that. Yeah. And I decided, okay, I'm going to devote my main energy to making film because I want to help raise the consciousness of the world. And so... Actually, a, a, a radical organization called the Students for Democratic Society called me because I had gotten a reputation as an experimental filmmaker and mm -hmm. shown around mm -hmm. New York and stuff. They called me and asked if I would make a film. This is the summer of 1970. And I turned them down because that was a political thing. And I sure. didn't feel politics was the best way to change things. Consciousness, raising consciousness first all the other stuff will follow. Hmm. And so it, six months later, seven months later, Maharishi asked me to make films for him. Wow. And I said, yes, because that was my opportunity to actually do that. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. So how did this uh, belief in raising consciousness come about? Did it was, do you, do you? Uh, you know, when I was in high school and um, I had some experiences, you know, mm -hmm. uh, sort of mystical, metaphysical experiences, just spontaneously. Mm -hmm. No one around me that I knew uh, was interested in stuff like that. But for some reason, I just started having them. And in high school, I tried learning to do Zen. I tried, you know, from books, different things, but nothing really worked. I don't know. It just kind of happened. I think, sure. you know, like many people, I was born with a certain amount and yeah. And uh, being in California, I think, helped that a lot. It was very different from Massachusetts. Also I, the time, I suppose, that time. And the time. Hmm. Yeah, there was a sort of upsurge of all of this. Hmm. And my mother was a very um, a bright, connected person who introduced me to some of the great um, poetry, uh, Allen Ginsberg and Lawrence Fer Ferlinghetti. Actually... She gave me Allen Ginsberg's 
poem Howl, which is a yeah, which is big deal phenomenal. in the West, yeah. and Lawrence Ferlinghetti's books mm. and stuff. When I was 13 or something, she passed away when I was 14. And when we moved to California, the first thing I did was I took the bus to San Francisco to Lawrence Ferlinghetti's bookstore called City Lights. And there behind the cash register was Lawrence Ferlinghetti. And there putting books in the shelf was Allen Ginsberg. Wow. It was unbelievable. It was wow. like, wow, I've, <laughs> I've come home. This is where I should be. So, And then you started seeing these odd characters appearing with long hair and Benjamin Franklin glasses and stuff. They were hippies, but yeah. no one knew what they were yet. And I was still in high school. So uh, it just, yeah, it was the time. And I was at the right time. I was in a band in art school called The Wildflower. And um, we rehearsed with Big Brother in the same studio at my art school. Wow. They would come in after us. And one day they showed up with this girl, the little girl from Texas was Janis Joplin. Oh my God. I was and thinking And we that. all hung around, let's, <laughs> let's see what she can wow. do. And wow. we never saw them again. They went right into the stratosphere. Wow. So did, did you was, actually have a conversation with Janice? Yeah, a little bit. I mean, you know, she, but she was a kid. She was like 16 or 17 or something. Little. Incredible. But boy, could she sing. Yeah. Did she have that voice back then as yeah. well? Yeah. Oh, it was incredible. And she had charisma and, you know, all of that. So, um, so the point is that I was in the middle of all of this. So this milieu was there. Yeah. And it was, and there were, at the time in the Bay Area, there were all these spiritual things available tibetan buddhism indonesian meditation zen uh, on and on and on baha'i and i looked into all of them and thought none of them really connected and then in 1967 i decided i needed to find a master hmm. i knew i didn't know what the hell i was doing so i actually because my dad was a pilot i had a pass where i could fly for free until oh, wow. i was and no wow. longer a dependent. So I just got on a plane and flew to England, thinking I was going to go to India or Tibet and find my master. But I had $25 and a, a duffel bag full of spiritual books and art supplies and a guitar. I mean, and I never made it out of England, fortunately for me, <laughs> I think. Um, and that's a whole, I'm actually writing a book about that because it's an incredible experience. I slept at Stonehenge one night, wow. which you could get away <laughs> with back then. Yeah, now of course it's a protected site; you wouldn't be yeah, allowed. Yeah, you could you could just be anyway. Mm. It, I had many, and I ended up working in a fruit, flower, and vegetable stand in Kent for a few weeks to raise the money to get back to the U.S. Wow! And uh, I had great experiences, but anyway, when I got back, I had one more semester of art school to finish. And the Beatles had started meditating. And I had friends in my art school, one of whom was here, by the way. He was a designer doing all the posters. And Oh, okay. Yeah, we're, we've remained friends. over. He's a surfer, as am I. Wow. And we've, we've, been, we've been friends for a long time. But anyway, um, uh, he and another lady friend of his were proselytizing Maharishi, Maharishi. And I thought, well, this is some stupid pop thing. I mean, I like the Beatles, but come on. this. And I thought, this is not worth anything. So a friend of mine, Maharishi, came to Berkeley to speak, and he dragged me to go see him. And when I saw Maharishi start to talk, I went, oh, this is the real deal. And you have to understand, this was Berkeley in the 60s. It was a civic auditorium, standing room only, and Maharishi talked, and one of the things he said was, when you learn to meditate, you don't have to change anything in your life, your religion, your diet, nothing. Just meditate twice a day and follow the laws of your land. And, you know, well, somebody in the question and answer at the end said, so Maharishi, you said we're supposed to follow the laws of our land, right? He said, yes, yes. Well, if that means getting drafted and going to Vietnam, should we do that? And he said, of course, if that's the law of the land. Well, that the, wasn't popular. The place went insane and mm. people were yelling and swearing at Maher. I mean, I thought, oh, this little monk from the Himalayas, oh no. Well, it was so impressive. He just sat quietly and let them 
go on for a while. And then the whole place just quieted down, quieted down. It was incredible. And then he said something. I don't even remember what he said, but it that was it just neutralized the whole thing. It was really a, I learned later that in India, he had talked with much rowdier, huger crowds. So this is probably nothing for him. <laughs> but um anyway, uh, so I started meditating. That's when I started doing TM. That's incredible. Yeah. That's incredible. A lot of people in your generation at that time. Yeah. Uh, took either two ways out of this kind right. of uh, they were either went into spiritual paths yep uh, or they went into psychedelic substances and things yeah. like that yeah. so was that ever a part of your life yeah. was that ever a yeah. temptation to follow that route when I was in high school um, well first of all I'm pretty sure now this is interesting so Tim Leary and Richard Alpert were at Harvard Sure, and they were doing that. And we the were LSD. living in a town near Harvard. And they did these, they had a house in the next town over from ours where they had people come and take LSD. Yeah. I think my mother probably did that. Oh, wow. <laughs> she was very adventurous, a Wellesley graduate, very smart, very talented. Um, I don't know for sure, but I think so. Anyway, yeah, because they had a lot of people going to that house. Yeah, and yeah. Just, uh, going yeah, and she did stuff like trips, that. LSD trips with yeah. them. Yeah. So, I, 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 there was a, Aldous Huxley wrote about, all kinds of intellectuals wrote about this stuff, and I was reading it all. And I started, I tried pot, and, and then in my senior year at high school, I gave a talk about the, spiritual and psychological benefits of LSD, even though I'd never had it. I'd been reading about it, <laughs> sure. and it was not illegal at the time. Mm -hmm. And then um, I took it a few times, had good experiences, but realized that drugs only could take you so far. And what I now understand is they don't allow you to transcend. You have interesting experiences, but not actually transcending into the field of pure consciousness. And the other problem with drugs is they have a very bad effect on your physiology. And I saw, I wasn't taking a lot, but I was smoking pot. And I took a few LSD trips, but it was aging me and making me get colds. And I said, I, um, so I stopped doing it and um, realized that was not the way to go, to get mm. enlightened. Mm. So, um, and you know, when you learn TM, and it was a much bigger deal then than it is now. But you were told you had to abstain from non-prescription drugs for two weeks before learning. So your nervous system was ready to take it, yeah. clear enough to, mm. yeah. Um, so, yeah, I did that. But it was pretty evident that that was a limited kind of thing. It only mm. take you so far. Mm. So, um, and I certainly saw plenty of lives train wrecks of lives coming sure. from that so sure it was yeah. pretty instructive to not continue in that direction yeah. so mm. once you started tm what was that like were you uh, immediately hooked did you did you get the experience of yeah. tm immediately or was it gradual something no like? no uh the very first time i meditated i transcended and it was really powerful it wasn't like angels and trumpets and it was just deep deep silence like a well of pure silence and yeah I, this is this is what i needed i mean it was pretty evident to me um i'll tell you another interesting story you can make of it what you will so at the time that was the vietnam war sure i went and got my master's degree at a small school in spokane washington when i got my MFA, I lost my student deferment. And this was 1969. So you could be drafted now. I, they called me up. Mm -hmm. I went to the draft board and um, went through the whole thing. And they stamped past 1A, you know. And there were all these farm kids and stuff who had visions of John Wayne, you know. They were all gung-ho. I said, I need to see a psychiatrist. So they sent me across town to this psychiatrist, and we talked, and I told him this and that, trying to get out. And he said, no, no, that's 
everybody say like I, I have homosexual tendencies. <laughs> no, that's normal. That no. And finally, I I leveled with the guy and said, "Look, I want to do service for my country, but this is not the kind of service I can do. That will if I get drafted, I'm going to Canada. I'm going underground, but I am not going in the army. I'm just telling you right now." And um, and then he wasn't really listening to me, so I got really heated. And right when that happened, I got this image of Maharishi's master in my mind. Now, I have to tell you, I didn't have pictures of anybody. The only time I ever saw that picture was when I was initiated, hmm. which was uh, two years prior, two and a half years. So I got this image of Guru Dev in my mind, and I started giving this guy a very forceful presentation. And he sat back and he looked at me and he thought, go back to the draft board. I'll see what I can do. And I go back and after about an hour, they call my name and he'd made me 4F, which meant not suitable. I was out. I never was going to have to be. Wow. And so, but then that was 1969. Two years later, I'm making films for Maharishi. Wow. So, and I did that for seven years. So I did my, what I said I would do. <laughs> I did my alternate service and uh but i i do believe my sense of it is that when maharishi came out to the world he recognized the people he'd look in the audience he'd see the people hmm. who were already connected to him that's my take on it sure sure and he and i was one of them and as were many and many many others i'm certainly nobody special um but uh I think that he recognized those people, drew them to him, gave them jobs to keep them close to him for as long as possible so that we could all absorb his sort of essence or whatever you might want to call it. And then off we went into the world to do whatever. And uh, here we are. Wow. 50 years later. <laughs> wow. So the initiation is one thing. But meeting the master is another thing, yeah. meeting Maharishi. Yeah. When did that happen for you when you met him personally? That's another interesting tale. So I taught for a year at this small college. Then my wife and I, she was my girlfriend, then we moved to New York City. And I started, I started working at the TM Center downtown in Greenwich Village as a checker that's a person that's trained so if a person a meditator comes in to the center with questions about their meditation there's a whole procedure you can go through that helps them to figure out what's and so i did that a couple times a week and i decided to become a teacher at that point and in that summer they had a preparatory course at a place called Poland Springs Maine that i decided to go to well, just before Poland Springs, Maharishi came and visited our center. So two things happened when he came that were important. And then something happened to Poland Springs. But So New York in 1970 was really funky, dirty, um, smelly, and it was summer and hot. And so we're standing on the sidewalk outside the center waiting for Maharishi's car to come. And I'm standing there and the car pulls up and the door opens, the back door opens. So it's, I'm facing it. I don't really see much of our issue, but I see his foot go out of the car across this gutter filled with like garbage and rotting stuff. But his foot was like pure. It was the relative and the absolute right in that little moment. That was like, whoa. That was a surprise. And then he started walking down the line of people who were giving him flowers and saying, Jay Gur Devon, I don't think I had a flower. I didn't know you were supposed to do that, actually. He walked past me and he kind of looked over and said, hi, how you doing? And kept going. And I, what? <laughs> it was like completely conversational normal. I thought, did I hallucinate that? But no, it really happened. So, see, I think he knew already. Hmm. This is somebody that is going to be doing something. So then I went to the course, and it was quite amazing. And um, we had groups with a group leader, with an older teacher that would kind of 
And we'd, Maharishi would lecture twice a day. And one night after his talk, I decided I wanted to just go out behind the lecture hall and be there when Maharishi went from the hall to his car. It's something people did. They'd have flowers and stuff. As it happened, it was just me and this older initiator who was a Norwegian opera singer named Ricardo. That's all I remember. And um, so we're standing side by side. Maharishi walks with Jerry Jarvis holding Maharishi's skin and stuff. And as Maharishi walks past, I suddenly, it's like a veil got pulled. And I suddenly saw Maharishi was all of creation, all the gods, all everything from the biggest to the, it was like completely mind blowing. Mm. I, I, and I was stunned. I just stood there like, and it was just a moment and then it passed and Maharishi got in his car and drove away. But Ricardo, who was standing next to me, put his arm around me, tapped me on the shoulder and said, very good. <laughs> <laughs> so somehow he knew what was going on. Yeah. So I, I already had at that early point, I had this kind of amazing connection and experience with Maharishi, but I had no desire to work for him or anything. I mean, mm -hmm. it was the first, I, I was, I had a mentor in the art world that had organized for me to go to a very a prestigious um, kind of retreat for artists. The Museum of Modern Art was talking to me about showing my films next the next fall in New York. I mean, I had things going on, and then I just never came back. <laughs> wow. And my mentor never spoke to me again. <laughs> yeah, he's joined a cult and all that and he sure. just wouldn't talk to me anymore so but i think i did the right thing and my brave wife my goodness pregnant mm. on this crazy journey nine months pregnant traveling through europe was she meditating as well yeah or? yeah okay. yeah um so it was interesting time wow yeah it's quite spectacular that you, yeah you could throw up all that all the prospects and yeah just but so, did you ever, when you started filming with Maharishi, did you ever regret your decision? No. Never? Mm -mm. No. No. Uh, even though there were many times when it was really hard. I won't, I won't you know, sugarcoat it. Uh, working closely with a master is not an easy thing often. Sure. And it's not because of the master. It's because of one's own issues that all come up, you know, and, but he also drove people really hard. I mean, the only time I ever missed a meditation in 50 something years was when I was working with Maharishi mm -hmm. because, you know, things would happen and you'd have to be there. And, um, yeah. Yeah. It, it can be tough. I mean, because they bring up things that's that right. need to be addressed. Yes, that's right. And they're not always pleasant. No, <laughs> no. And he was always, I have to say, kind to me, sweet. I made mistakes. You know, I screwed up on various things. He never was, you know, harsh. I saw him with some people be like flamethrower harsh, mm -hmm. but clearly that's what they needed sure. for whatever reason, you know, but luckily for, or well, whatever, it just never, that wasn't the way it was. But I also wasn't you know, one of the important people around Maharishi, I, you know, I was this very minor hmm. character. I'm not in hardly any photographs, you know, or any of that kind of stuff. And I don't really care. It's not why I was there. Hmm. For some people, it was really important that they be close to Maharishi. and Get his personal attention. Yeah, and all that. I never asked him a personal question. I thought it was inappropriate, personally. Hmm. And, and I also never, you know, it was a very easy natural relationship but there was no it was just i don't know it's just easy and i think that he appreciated that that there wasn't this kind of adulation and over you know it's just he must be getting it from everybody he taught you constantly <laughs> i saw lots of things that was just i don't know how actually i don't know how he did it to be honest here's an indian guy from a pretty conservative indian background mm. suddenly in the west for 50 years Mostly. I mean, he did go back to India and whatnot, but dealing with all these 60s crazy kids, <laughs> hey, 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 I don't know. I, and then when I was running the David Lynch program, every week I'd give a, a seminar 
in consciousness related stuff, you know, knowledge. And so I was in a very tiny way mimicking what Maharishi had been doing. And that's when I really began to get a sense of what he, I mean, I, I just don't know how, well, he did it because he's nature speaking English, you know, and all that, but still he was a person and, you know, I, I just, and, you know, he never, like, here's another, the guy that dragged me to see Maharishi speak, a classmate in art school, um, he eventually, a few years later, became one of Maharishi's cooks. Oh, okay. He was a really good cook. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so about three and a half years ago, I interviewed him for the film. He oh, was wow. in Palm Springs. And, I mean, he was this gay kind of wild, interesting character who didn't really stay with the TM movement. I think he kept meditating, but he lived his own life. Well, when I interviewed him, I mentioned to him that he had dragged me to go see Maharishi. And he said, no, you dragged me to go see him. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know. I, I think I'm right. But he passed away not long after that, unfortunately. But um, mm -hmm. uh that's interesting that somebody, you know, some people come into our lives just to lead us to a path. Yeah. And but, then... but we remained friends hmm. for the whole time. And um, he he told me some things about, because he not just cooked for Maharishi, he took, you know, got his dhotis washed and cleaned up and all of that. And he said that what Maharishi had with him were two dhotis, the cashmere shawl, hmm. uh, beads, picture of Gurudev, a picture of uh, some part of Mother Divine, Divine Mother. I don't know which, maybe Saraswati. I don't really know. But um, And uh, the, the antelope or deer skin, whatever it was, and the sandals. That's, That's kind it. of it. Hmm. Maybe his passport. <laughs> he didn't have anything. And I, as I understand it, that he never actually owned anything. He just had what he needed and this huge empire grew around him. I mean, he was a very good business person as it turns out and taught me a lot about business and how to negotiate and stuff. And um, so he was responsible for the accumulation of all of this, but he never was, he never possessed it. Hmm. Hmm. He, and so uh, very interesting. So when you're filming uh, Maharishi, for seven years you were filming, you were traveling, and your wife was traveling along as well. And, yeah, yeah. For, we, he, for a few years. Then he, when we had our second kid, then he sent us to the Academy in Livingston Manor to set up the film lab. So we mm -hmm. didn't travel with him at that okay. point. Okay, okay. but you were so doing work Oh, yeah, it's very, I mean, I was yeah. in contact with him. I had crazy, interesting stories. Oh, my <laughs> God. Uh one time when he first started doing the TM city program, the first course they did was in India. And I think some, maybe a Kumbh Mela, but a Mela of some sort. Mm -hmm. They were in it and he had an Indian cameraman film that. And, um, cause we processed all the film from everybody. And, um, so we processed it and he said, uh, he wanted to see the print but that I couldn't show it to anybody. It was totally top secret. And it was pretty wild. I mean, this one young guy, there's maybe 40 people, most, you know, all Indian women in saris, guys dressed in Indian style, sitting on the floor. And then this one guy starts hopping and vibrating, which is part of what happens when you do this particular sutra, the flying sutra. And then all of a sudden, he just starts cartwheeling around the room, almost like a firework. Wow. I wow. mean, just crashing into people and stuff. It was really amazing. Um, anyway, that's basically what happened. So I make the print. And then this woman calls me, who is a childhood friend. She's a very well-known psychoanalyst in academia. Her husband was William Gibson who wrote The Miracle Worker. I mean, these are like important people. And they were friends from my childhood in Massachusetts. 
She said, I've heard there's a film about this. She was nervous because she was in the establishment, a top academician, and suddenly this wacky flying thing comes out of. Mm -hmm. Sure. And so she's very nervous about her reputation and everything. She said, I'm going to hire a plane and fly there to see this. I said, I'm sorry, I can't show it to you. I, Mara, she said, I can't show it to anybody. And she yelled at me and argued. And I said, no, I can't. Sorry. And um, so I didn't. And she never spoke to me again. Oh, my God. Boom, gone. Mm. So there were interesting moments like that. Mm. So when you were working for the Maharishi, was what prompted the decision to go into Hollywood? Because um, I guess you were pretty much established in uh, being with Maharishi and yeah. working for him. Oh, I well, it's interesting. One of the interviews I did was with one of the Srivastava family, who are the great nephew of Maharishi. His okay. grandfather was Maharishi's brother. And when we were at our academy in Livingston Manor, I, I'm a creative guy, and I wasn't really satisfied with making lecture films. Sure. I wanted to make interesting films, and we produced some really cool programming about photography and consciousness. We interviewed Ansel Adams and oh, all, wow. all kinds of interesting stuff. Well, at a certain point, Maharishi sent his young nephew uh, to put a stop to that. So this young guy shows up in Livingston Manor in a narrow hat and a brocaded was it what's it a shawas uh, yeah it's a sherwani yeah yeah and he's like the skinny kid and he nervously is telling us that we have to just do the knowledge no more of this creative experimental stuff, stuff. yeah <laughs> no more it wasn't even experimental it was just you know reaching out to the public in sure. a creative i thought interesting way anyway so okay and then he moved the whole thing to switzerland anyway well I interviewed, it turns out I was interviewing this guy and it suddenly dawned on me that was the same guy. But now it's <laughs> 50 years later Wow! and we're both heavier, balder. And I said, you were sent to Livingston Manor when you were like 19. <laughs> and he said, you're to make, right. Go make Michael an offer he can't refuse. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that was, was Tommy uh, Hagen coming to you. <laughs> <laughs> that was a pretty, pretty good moment, actually. <laughs> wow, incredible. Incredible. Yeah. So, uh, did you take that? I mean, did you take that to heart that you were yeah, asked to stop? Of course. This? If he said do it, I did it. Yeah. 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 But, but I I needed obviously. I this wasn't going to continue, and so we moved at his instructions in January of seventy eight. We moved the entire film lab, and we had. Editing equipment, big flatbed, Steenbeck editors, you know, lots and lots of stuff to Switzerland and set it up again in an old, what had been a monastery, then a spa on the side of the Alp Mountains. It took about six months. And um, we we're going to train European kids to how to run all this stuff, supposedly. Um, and one day in May, we were pretty much done. And I was standing there. It was a beautiful spring day in the Alps. Very beautiful there. And all of a sudden, it hit me that I wasn't there to make films. Like I said before, I was there just to be with Maharishi. I needed the excuse of a job. And then I realized that was true of all these young people, scientists, designers. We all, from the West, you don't go off with a master for seven or eight or ten years. Mm. You have to have a job. and so. And so I realized, oh, I was here just to be with Maharishi and get whatever I could of his teaching in essence. The next day he called me in to a meeting and said, okay, it's time for you to go. And uh, so I, you know, we talked about what I would do and everything. And I said, I'm going to go to Los Angeles and make films. And that's what I did. Wow. And art, I, you know, do art and film, but I'm an artist. I have to do that. And, mm. um, so there was no uh, no regret that way either that you had to go to LA and leave no, the uh, not at all not being around a little Maharishi. sad but you know yeah. I I needed to do and I also had to make money sure. I had two boys sure and we didn't get paid for seven years wow my social security so how how were you sustaining yourself well they paid our room and board and travel uh -huh. and they gave us fifty bucks a month to buy 
But, you know, I would have to ask for extra money to buy a winter coat for my kid and stuff. I mean, sure. it was challenging. We were one of the very few people that had children at the time. Mm -hmm. And um, so it wasn't about money. And uh, so I had to go have a career and make money and bring up my family and do all that stuff. So. So did the films you make before uh, you made before you uh, started meditation, and now you go back to Hollywood and get into films again, but these, I'm saying, those films you were making for yourself pretty yeah. much, but now you have to do it uh, for someone else uh, yeah. to get paid. Yeah. So was that difficult? Oh, so <laughs> one week I'm in the Alps with Maharishi. Two weeks later, literally, I'm, I, I got a job as an editor almost immediately. Mm -hmm. I had one name, and and he hired me. Mm -hmm. And my first job was editing a, a film for the city of LA or for for the transportation authority about ride sharing. You know, they're trying to get and they yeah. had metered the on ramps and anyway. So these two maniac guys were the producers. You know, long hair, chain smoking cigarettes. We're in an editing room with a cloud of talking about orgies and hot tubs and all this crazy. I mean, it was like, wow. That Quite was my contrast. first job. Huh? Quite a contrast to the market. Quite a contrast. And um, and then it went on from there. And I, I was lucky. I mean, I was good at what I do. So I, when I had an opportunity, I you know was able to take advantage of it. Um, so I just started working. And one thing led to another. And I started a year and a... What happened is the Beach Boys were meditators mm -hmm. and they had some kind of a tax shelter deal with the with Germans. I don't know. They had to they would be given money that had to be spent by midnight at the end of the year. And working at this editing company, downstairs was a little film laboratory. They needed a manager. Because I knew how to do that, mm -hmm. I took over doing that as well. Oh, wow. They did mostly skiing films and stuff. And so I had this lab, and through the Beach Boys, I got this job editing a film about Greenpeace that a CBS record producer had dropped out of the music business, gone on this voyage with Greenpeace with a camera guy and filmed all this stuff, and I edited it. And it was very successful. And that producer guy, um, you know, we became friends and then he disappeared. And so I kept editing and I was getting restless just editing because I was making some rather incompetent directors look good and get <laughs> more directing jobs. And I just get paid and, hey, thanks a lot. So I was getting a little restless with that. And suddenly this guy appears back in my life. He's now the head of international marketing at Motown, which oh, wow. had its headquarters in Hollywood. And he said, hey, I need help. We're doing these like music clips and we're doing a bunch of Rick James and I need help with that. Do you want to? And so I did. I started working with them and I became one of the early producers of music videos before wow. MTV. Before MTV. Wow. Yeah. And they were trying to figure it. See, the record companies back then produce these clips of songs mm -hmm. and they'd um so they'd send there were big music shows in japan germany and england and they'd send a top act to be there but they'd have these clips of their lesser acts on 16 millimeter and so i started doing some of those for them and then um the guys that started mtv were very clever they realized all the music record companies had this programming, they didn't know what to do with it. Mm. Um, so they just decided they'd hire a VJ and have a tiny little set, probably about the size of this. That was MTV. Wow. And the record company just gave them the programming. Yes. That's how it started. And I just happened to be right there when that happened. And so <clears throat> I did, I was one of the bigger music video producers for a couple of wow. years. And did, wow. you know, Lionel Richie and, you know, some pretty big names. And um, that was, and so that really established my company. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was like real work and we were doing some pretty big things. 
but it got tiresome that world the music world it just especially in the 80s hmm. there were drugs there was all that and i wanted nothing to do with any of that and so so maybe it was tm that kept you grounded because totally. uh, oh on the film business are you kidding <laughs> it's such an exhausting challenging business and so even during shoots i would just go at dinner time you know, they have a caterer i just say somebody keep give me a meal i'd go meditate find mm. a corner or go to my car and um and then after dinner i'd be have have energy everybody sure. else would be you know yeah 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 of drinking course. coffee and who knows what else and um yeah for me it was it was a total lifesaver and for people like andy kaufman he had in his contract that he had to meditate for an hour each day in the evening. Wow. That was wow. part of his deal. <laughs> and uh, David Lynch, same thing. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's a total lifesaver. And I was the director of photography on a silly teen movie called The Invisible Kid with Karen Black and China Phillips and a silly film. Um, and so every day I'd go meditate and this guy, electrician on my crew, this a Lebanese kid, came up to me one day and said, so you go to your car every day. Are you meditating? I said, yeah. He said, TM? I said, yeah. He said, me too. Can we meditate together? So we started meditating every wow. day together. So your own little satsang, huh? And then, this is really cool. So he was young, maybe 19, and he said, I want to make features and I'm going to do it and I'm not getting much traction in Hollywood because I'm an Arab and they don't like Arabs and all this. And he eventually went back to Lebanon, continued meditating, became a Siddha and produced a number of spectacularly good feature films. One of which was nominated for an Oscar. Wow. I think six or seven years ago. Wow. I've forgotten the name, but it's about a Palestinian surgeon who works at Israeli hospitals, whose wife becomes a terrorist. Oh, and, a, you know, it's a whole complicated story about all of that. But um, so that was pretty cool to see him actually follow through and do that. Amazing. Yeah. I mean, because a lot of people would say that uh, if you're meditating, you've kind of tuned out of the of the rat race, of the, um, you have no ambition left. Not at all. Hmm. No, I th I'd say completely the opposite. Um, I mean, where, what is creativity? Where does that come from? In my experience, we are infinite beings who are nature itself, who are in constant co-creation of the world we live in. And the source of all thinking and our being is pure creation. If you're in touch with that every day, I mean, being creative isn't an issue. Sure. And, you know, the, the way, and you have to remember, what Maharishi did, he brought out this technique for householders. It's not for monks. Mm -hmm. And the efficacy of it is that you do it twice a day. You transcend when you're meditating, just like some other meditations. But the the what he said is you meditate twice a day and then live fully. Mm. Don't hold back. I mean, and I took that to heart that you totally, it doesn't matter what you do. You could... I just but do it full, full on. Don't, and that's how the transcendent that you experience in meditation slowly gets integrated into your life through the intensity of the activity. He had a, a really good analogy. He said it was like um, dyeing a cloth, where you dip it into the dye, then you put it out in the sun to fade. That's the activity. Then mm -hmm. you transcend. You dip it in the dye put it out in the sun to fade. You do that over and over again, and eventually you get this brilliant, pure color. Which is not going to Yeah. Permanent. That's the key. Mm. And that's how it works. And so this notion that somehow meditating takes you away from life, if you're a monk, maybe so, but not this. It's for people in the world. And the whole point is to have as many enlightened people in the world as possible, because that's the only way all these problems that we're facing are going to get solved. It's. He also had another sort of saying he liked, which is, you don't attack the darkness on the level of darkness. 
you bring light and the darkness just disappears. Hmm. So, which is a way of saying, you know, if you try to solve problems on the level of the problem, it will not be successful. You mm -hmm. have to have something that makes the problem just not be there. Wow. That's amazing. So. That's amazing. And in your Hollywood time, did you ever have a chance to uh, work with David Lynch or meet David Lynch? Well, when I, not when I was, um, you know, in Hollywood, but um, when I took over running the David Lynch graduate program, I got to know him quite well. And he'd come visit with our students. We Zoomed with him once a week. Um, and I filmed him for this film. Oh, his, okay. You know, so um, he's, and, and, you know, David started the David Lynch Foundation, which is dedicated to teaching TM to at-risk students in ghettos and stuff and, and uh, military veterans who are suffering from PTSD. It's very successful. Mm -hmm. And thousands and thousands of people have learned it. It's all at a scholarship basis. They raise the money. And so, yeah, I've gotten to know David. He's a really, really good guy. Yeah. I mean, and completely devoted to Maharishi and what Maharishi's mission wow. is. But one would uh, one wouldn't get the sense of uh, one would get wouldn't get the sense of uh, David being a meditator by watching his films because some of them are really dark as well. <laughs> so yeah, and I and he's been hassled I mean Maharishi very gently chided him about that. Mm -hmm. But as David said, you know, that's my muse. And that's sure. just the way it is. And, you know, um, this is like going out with the girl you can't bring home to meet mom. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, he doesn't make any excuses. This is his muse. And and uh, that's what he does. But, but on he, the other hand, those dark films have given him the, the that's right. fame yeah. to kind of take TM to so many more people. Personally, I think David's greatest accomplishment will be his foundation. Mm -hmm. I love his films mostly, not all, but <laughs> I think he's brilliant and um, and a really great filmmaker, but his greatest accomplishment is this foundation. That's my opinion. And I, I really honor him from for putting putting his money where his mouth is and really following through on yeah, that. Yeah, because of a lot of the Hollywood crowd does mouth the stuff That's right. that of yep. helping people. And and David uh, really has done it, and hmm. um, it's a beautiful thing. So, And I how's give, your time at the university been? Are you still teaching there? No. I There are a couple things. Uh, I'm a person who has avoided hierarchies my whole life. For sure, the, the authoritative structures. Whatever it is, mm. and that's true in Hollywood. And it's true in academia, which I did not enjoy. And it's true in the TM movement, the, the organization. Nothing wrong with that. There are lots of people who want that and need it. I have no interest in that. So teaching, I loved the teaching. Um, but I didn't really enjoy being in Iowa very much. It has its beauty, but it's not for me. And academia is just not my cup of tea i don't know what to mm. say it's just it just isn't and um and I, they they really i uh, they needed more financial support for this program mm. mfa film programs are extremely expensive for sure none yeah. of them make money mm. they depend on endowments and maharishi university didn't have that kind of endowment for that use so it never quite was able to achieve its potential the students that went there had great experiences, and some of them are doing spectacularly well in Hollywood, I will say. So I think it was successful. It's just um, pretty hard to keep it going at the level it needed to be at. And for me personally, I just didn't really want to continue doing that. Mm. So mm. I'm much happier just being an independent artist. Absolutely. And uh, Absolutely. that's just how it is. <laughs> And about this event, it's your first trip to India, 10,000 for World Peace yeah. here at Kana Shantiwana. What was your experience during the program? Oh, well, this was, there are a few things. Um, the minute I got off the plane, and I've traveled a lot, I've filmed mm -hmm. all over the world. And I, the minute I get off the plane anywhere, 
there's a first feeling. Sure. And 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 when I got off the plane here, what I my first feeling was softness. There's a softness to India. I know it's crazy and chaotic and all of that, and, but there's an essential softness and spiritual quality to India that was very evident to me. Coming to Kanha village here, Kanha Shantivanam, this is like an ideal village. And I know that. This is not like much of India, but that's fine with me. I mean, listen, this couldn't have been a better place to have this, in my opinion. You have a whole village beautifully done um, with people working and living here who are all devoted to the same basic thing. What's not to like? Mm. And the, by, also, by the way, the food was great. <laughs> <laughs> Very important, actually. Sure. sure. And it was really, really good. And I think everybody agreed on that. So, uh, yeah, you mentioned the papayas and the samosa. <laughs> yeah, but all of it was good. And, and that was pretty much a uniform feeling for most of the people I spoke with. So, no, it's been a great experience. And I do want to come back to India. I have a lot more to film in other parts of India. And uh, I'd love to come back here sometime. So, um, we'll see. Yes, absolutely. And, and I just want to say. Yes. The staff here, the uh, Vikram and you, Rudy, and your all your people, they're really professional and really good people to work with and very supportive. And I really, really appreciate that. Thank you so much. Yeah. That's so kind of you to say yeah. thank you so much. I wanted to ask you as someone who's been with Maharishi for such a long time, how was it not having him in his physical form? Did you take that hard? No. Well, first of all, the last time I physically was around him was 1978. Mm -hmm. I didn't see him again after, after that. that. Okay. But my relationship with him got closer, interestingly, and more intimate over time. And honestly, his passing, while a little bit surprising, kind of, for me, it wasn't a big kind of grieving thing at all. I, uh, but my relationship has continued. And maybe even deepened. So I don't, I, well, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's an ongoing journey. Yes, it is. And very deep and profound. And um, uh, I'm, my feeling is that Maharishi and the entire uh, tradition, the holy tradition of the Shankara tradition, they're active and well and doing things on a subtler level mm. to help with this situation and other things in creation. That's my experience. That's totally personal. Mm. I won't go into detail, but that's how I see how I see things happening. And um so so lastly, Michael, how do you see this entire journey you've had amazing from uh, from uh, you know california to yeah. and to europe traveling all around and uh, now here in india as well what has what has changed for you from the michael who was growing up uh, in massachusetts uh how has michael changed today well i mean you know i knew when i started to do tm that it would lead to a certain state of enlightenment. I didn't understand how much beyond that it would go. And I have to say, it's so far exceeded my expectations that um, I just feel grateful. And um, yeah, I, I mean, it's the whole journey has been astonishing full of love and light and creative creativity. And um, I've been extraordinarily lucky. I've been working at this very crazy business for 60 years and I'm still doing it. And the future just seems brighter and bigger to me. Wow. Wow. So, That's a beautiful note to end on this yeah. optimism for the future. Yeah. And thank you. 
That Thank was really you. This lovely. is very nice and a real pleasure to have met you and to just have been working in this atmosphere. No, thank you. The pleasure was all ours. And uh, <laughs> we hope to have you back. I hope, hope so. <laughs> well, thanks. Thank you so much, Michael. That was lovely. Jay Gurudev to you. Jay Gurudev. Thank you for tuning into this episode of KanaCast. Please follow and subscribe to KanaCast on Spotify, YouTube, and Instagram. Until next time. Woof, woof.